I'm going to talk to you today about the seven parts of salvation according to the King James Bible. Uh, there's a lot of uh, false gospels out there being preached by false prophets, and uh, they're coming out and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's important to define occasionally what is the gospel. All right. There are seven parts of true biblical salvation. Let me show you. Number one, you have conviction of sin. We're going to go over each of these in detail in this study. Conviction of sin. Number two, you have repentance. Number three, you have God's grace. Number four, you have belief. Number five, faith. Six, prayer. And number seven, a life change. All right. And you could, of course, you know, you could come up with your own list. It might not agree with this exactly, but this, these are the seven basic parts of salvation. All right. Now, if you'll excuse me while I use my extremely high tech system here, um, I'm just going to push this thing right up here like this. There. Dazzling, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Number one, conviction of sin. All right. And this is based upon years and years and years of preaching, of teaching the Word of God, of going door to door, of witnessing to people, okay? Dealing with people from all different cultures and things like this. So I'm not a, some kind of newbie or something to this whole thing. We're going to talk about conviction of sin. This is the first uh, and most important part of the gospel, all right? Romans chapter 7. And we're going to go to three different passages for each of these seven points. And there's a whole lot more we could go to, but this is where we're going to go for now. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 13. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the, the law sin was dead. For I was al alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid." But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Okay? The very basic level that you need to start somebody out on when you witness them is, are you a sinner? I did not say, we are all sinners. I said, are you a sinner? Personal conviction of sin. If that's not there, you're wasting your time. I'll tell you that. And the most basic form of it is the Ten Commandments, the law of God. The law is given to convert the sinner. All right. We're not talking about uh, are you a um, pedophile, satanic ritual abuse um, thief that's robbed, that's stolen $20 billion from banks around the world and killed 58 people or something. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, because most people haven't done those things, and you'll get that from people. Well, I'm not that bad. I've never killed anybody. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that one. You take them to the law, to the Ten Commandments, according to the Scriptures. Okay? I'll show you another passage on this. Galatians chapter 3. The book of Galatians. Beginning in verse 19, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Let me just, I got to say something else here before we continue. Um, this is a Bible believing channel. That's why I am not putting the scriptures up on the screen for you. I'm expecting you to get a King James Bible, which is the real one in, in the English world. You can watch other videos on that. Get a King James Bible and look these scriptures up yourself. Learn to turn in a paper King James Bible to the scriptures and make sure that I'm telling you the truth. You see? That way I can't deceive you because you're looking and saying, wait, it doesn't say that or, oh yeah, it does say that. Just need to say that. Okay. There, right there. Okay. <laughs> Get back to the scriptures. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator, mediator of one, but God is one. 
Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. If you're Jewish, you your law system that you had there in the Old Testament, if that was the final thing that God had done, then you should be able to know for sure that you're going to go, well, you would say be resurrected and things, in, you know, when the Messiah shows up and things like that. But you don't know for sure, do you? That's why you have sons that are trying to pray for you and things like that so that you can attain to that resurrection. Kind of like Catholics praying for their dead relatives in purgatory. Better think about that. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Faith comes after the law. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Okay? But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So anybody that tries to get you back under the Ten Commandments and get you back to the Old Testament system of doing things, uh, they need to read the book of Galatians. You see, when faith comes, which is up there, when faith comes, we're no longer under the law. The law is there to convict you of your personal sin. Say, well, what about you? I'm a sinner. I'm a saved sinner, though. That's the difference, you see. I'm not like a lot of you people out there that are lost and trying to convince yourself that God has okay with your sins and things like this, and you don't need to have this part of salvation. You don't need to be convicted of your personal sins. Just, oh, we're all sinners, and just a sin in general. And sin. No, you have personal sins that you know about. And if you go over the basics of just the Ten Commandments, you're going to see how wicked you really are. All right? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Everybody will hit, it, hit everybody, in other words. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul points it himself. He doesn't say of whom we are all sinners. We are all, we're all, you know, I am chief. And until you reach this level of personal conviction of your personal sins, salvation is meaningless. Leading people through prayers or telling them to just believe or whatever else, it's all meaningless. And you see, the majority of false gospels, this is the one that they'll reject. I'll tell you that right now. And they'll have you do a bunch of other things, but leave this out right here. I mean, think about this. Why is it that most people don't get saved? I mean, if it's just belief or if it's just a prayer that you pray or whatever else, why do most people reject Jesus Christ? Right there. Conviction of sins. I remember the one time when we were out door to door and a brother was with me, Brother Jesse Dulesky at the time. And um, he was. we were talking to this guy in this trailer park and this guy was just like, you know, I'd, I'd actually like to know how to get saved. And Brother Jesse was like, okay, are you a sinner? Well, I, you know, I guess technically everybody's a sinner and things. And he said, yes, but, you know, do you feel that you've wronged God? Do you feel like if you went to stand before God right now that he would cast you into hell? Say, depart from me, curse it into everlasting fire. The guy was like, no, I don't think it, you know, it's not that bad. And Jesse said, okay, you're not ready for salvation. Would some of you do that? The guy said he wanted to be saved. But there was no personal conviction of sin. He didn't think he was a bad person. So you know what would have happened if we would have led him in some little prayer or told him to believe or something like this, and Jesus loves you enough to die for you and all this stuff. If we would have done that, we would have made him a child of hell. You need to have personal conviction of sin before you get saved. That's the first step. All right? Let's go on to number two. So you have somebody, they have personal conviction of sin. What comes next? Repentance. Let's look at the definition biblically in here about the repentance. What is repentance? Mark chapter 2. 
And again, you know, I mean, this, this subject is way bigger than what I can put into this, you know, study here. And there's so many verses on repentance. But Mark chapter 2, verse 17, I have a whole study on this thing. I made a sign. This is out front of our place here. Mark chapter 2, verse 17, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What is repentance? They say, change of mind. That's correct. Change of direction. That's correct. Total, complete repentance and turning from sin. That's wrong. Okay, you're not going to be able to turn from all your sins before you get saved. And guess what? You won't be able to turn from all of them after you get saved. Your attitude changes towards sin. You see? You stop trusting in yourself. You stop saying, you know what? I'm not that bad of a person. When conviction, personal conviction of personal sins comes, you will say, I am rotten. I am disgusting. Like the publican. In the Bible, that he's he can't even look up to heaven, and he just smites on his chest, and he says, "God, be merciful to me, a sinner." Yeah, you'll get there when you're truly broken, when you're truly ready for repentance. Sinners to repentance. You see, all of a sudden you start to say, "I'm sick. I'm sick of the life that I've had. I'm sick of this sin cursed world. I'm sick and tired of of everything." I want something to change. You're ready for the gospel at that point in time. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says here, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Repentance comes, points you to salvation. Repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's two types of sorrow there. There's godly sorrow and there's sorrow of the world. You say, how do you know? Read it. Read the text. That's what it says. When you have godly sorrow, you say, I've sinned against God. You say, well, but I, I remember this one time I picked on this, this retarded uh, kid in, in high school or something like that, or I, I, I was rude to some older woman or something like that. I, I should go back and try to reconcile things and talk about our differences and well, that might be a good thing, but you, you know what? That's not going to get you to the point of salvation. See, what you have to realize is, I made fun of somebody. I stole something. I was, you know, used blasphemy. I used, you know, whatever. You did whatever sins that you yourself are, are guilty of. When you get to that point where you realize, I did those things and I wronged people, but you know what? I'm going to answer to God for this. I'm going to answer to my Creator. See, you can run away from people that you've wronged. You can. You know you can. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the sins that you've committed, uh, nobody else knows about them. Do they? There's some secret things that you've done and secret things that you've thought that you'd be really ashamed to have brought out. But guess what? They come out at the judgment. So when you realize that and you go, I've sinned before a holy, righteous, perfect God that's going to judge me and bring up everything. The Bible says in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. He's going to judge your secrets. Another portion of Scripture talks about Him judging your thoughts. Your thoughts. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, whether it be good or bad. He's going to judge you for your words. He's going to judge you for your thoughts. And for your secrets. You know what that should lead you to? Godly sorrow. Worketh repentance to salvation. All of a sudden you have a changed mind. All of a sudden you realize, I'm not going to be good enough to make it, am I? No, you're not. See? What about the sorrow of the world? Worketh death. Well, you can pretty much just look at any actor in, in Hollywood or any wealthy businessman or whatever else, things like this. They get sorry after a while. A lot of times they'll commit suicide. They don't believe that they've wronged God. They just believe, you know, my, I've ruined my life. I've, I've really messed up and whatever else. Sorrow of the world worketh death. You see, it's two different things. But let's look at the last one here. Acts chapter 20, verse 21.
Acts chapter 20, verse 21 says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. They say, well, you see, repentance just means that you're turning from unbelief to belief. Um, that's foolish. That's called Jack Hiles' quick prayerism, his little scam to get more people in so he can get their money. The guy was all about money. He was a fraud. Okay? You're not turning from unbelief to belief in repentance. That's stupid. Right? I mean, un return turning from unbelief to belief toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. How does that make any sense? No, repentance toward God is saying godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Personal conviction of sin leads you to repentance and that leads you into salvation. You have repentance toward God. You say, God, I'm not good. I'm a sinner. What about the other people? I don't care about the other people. I know I'm going to have to stand before God and I'm going to, if I have to give an account for my secrets, for my thoughts, and for the words I've spoken... Those three things right there, my goose is cooked. I'm in trouble. You see? Let's continue. As I flip the next page here. Grace of God. Okay? You realize I'm a sinner. I'm gonna have a changed mind. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say to myself, I, I think I, I think I can make it, you know. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, witnessing to people over the years, how many times I heard that one. I mean, that was the number one thing we heard. Um, I, I think I'll make it. I think I, you know, I'll be all right. I, I'm, I'm okay. No repentance toward God. But when you get to that point where you're broken and you realize, I've wronged God, what am I going to do? I'm without hope. I can't do anything. I can't, you know, hopefully my good works will outweigh my bad works and just do lots of good works. You'll never know. You'll never be able to have peace over your eternity with that. Don't try to clean up your sinful flesh without Jesus Christ, without His blood washing those sins away. Okay? What you'll find out about, though, is that God has grace. Something that you don't deserve, in other words. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, the famous Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. You see the repentance there? It's not of yourself. You have to turn from thinking that you're good enough. It is the gift of God. Can you force a gift from Him? No. Um, he has to give it to you. Not of works, lest any man should boast. All right? Well, if you come to confessional enough, and if you confess your sins to the priest, and if you do penance because of different sins that you've confessed, and if you wear the scapular around your neck and, and your rosary, you say the rosary, you know, however many times a day, and, and our Father, and Hail Mary, and, you know, all the other stuff. And if you, if you give to the poor, and if you're always faithfully attending the Eucharist, and think, uh-uh, no, nope, are you a sinner? Personal conviction of sin turning from that thought that I'm a good person, I can make it into heaven on my own works or whatever else, and, you know, know what I mean? And then you understand that, that God has grace for you, and then He provided a way for you to go to heaven. Understand it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 says here, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Yeah, that's what I am. I'm a minister of the Lord. All right? And I understand, you know, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. I can't earn my salvation. I can never work my way into heaven. I had to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because I was a sinner. Right? Personal conviction of sin. And somebody says, oh, he said was a sinner. That means he doesn't think he's a sinner anymore. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm still a sinner. I'm just a redeemed sinner now. Big difference there. And the Lord helps me to live in such a way that I don't do the sins of my past. Doesn't mean I don't mess up. Certainly do. But we'll talk more about that as we continue. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5 through 6. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, 
whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Okay? Now I wanted to use those two, these two scriptures right here, Ephesians 3, 7, Colossians 1, 5 through 6. I use both of those because it actually says grace of God. All right? For by grace are ye saved. You know, it's a gift of God. So you see it there, but these two definitely spell it right out. That's why I use that, these two scriptures. There's other scriptures that are even better to show the grace of God. All right? But these actually use the, the wording grace of God. But look at that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven eternity, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. You see? This book, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. True salvation will bring forth fruit. We'll talk more about that as we continue. As it doth also in you, since the day ye heard it, heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Yeah. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. You see? The grace of God in truth. Jesus Christ. Pretty interesting. Let's go to number four. What do we have next? We have belief. Okay. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. Okay. Paul and Silas are in prison. The prison keeper comes to them. If there's this earthquake, he's going to kill himself. Paul says, don't do that, you know, essentially. He comes in. Verse 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Okay? And you say, well, Where was the other things? Where's the conviction of sin? Where's the repentance? Where's the grace of God? Very simple. He was already broken. He was going to kill himself. He thought all the prisoners escaped, and he realized, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for this. They're going to execute me. So he pulls a sword out, and he's going like this. He's going to kill himself. He's broken, you see. Paul says, do thyself no harm. Stop. Don't do that. And he comes in and falls down. Came in, verse 29, then he came, called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. He's in a broken state. You see, you don't have to do a whole lot of, let me take you through the Ten Commandments and things like that. You get somebody that's truly broken, that's just sick and tired of the life of sin, and they're just like, I, I need help. I need to be saved. And they're, and they're crying, and they're weeping. They're like, please, God, save me. You don't have to say, are you a sinner? <laughs> they know. They're broken. The law is there for people that have self-righteous pride to show them that they're sinners. And if they don't ever admit to it, leave them. Very simple. We have next, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 14. It says here, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, the Word of God. Whereunto he called you, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, the salvation that comes there, salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Yeah, you have to believe the truth. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you get to that point of wanting to be saved, turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God... Which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 
The Bible talks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You say, well, I, I believe that Jesus died for me, but I reject the Bible. Sorry, you're not saved. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 talks about, These things have I written unto you, that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have everlasting life. A lot of these I'm quoting from memory. I might not be getting them word for word, but you see my point here. All right? It's the Scriptures. This is the truth. You believe in Jesus Christ, but you aren't going to know Jesus Christ apart from this book. So you say, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I sure do reject that King James Bible. Sorry, you're lost. Sorry. I mean, how can you, why would you reject the written record of God's Son? Doesn't make any sense. I'm using the uh, Reims New Testament, Je the Jesuit perversion of 1582. Uh, it's good for something. You know, it's a good paperweight. I'm not going to get any truth out of it, but, uh, you know, it's a good paperweight. How about faith? Romans chapter 3. And I know somebody's out there screaming, you, you covered these other verses. I know, I know. There's lots of verses to cover in terms of the gospel. But I'm just trying to go through ones here just to define different terms. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. Okay. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We saw that earlier. Okay, conviction of sin. Right? You have to, the, the law is going to bring you to the knowledge, I'm a sinner. But you can't get right by keeping the law. Because nobody can keep the law. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Okay, let me just stop there for a minute. Uh, you're, you know, some of this stuff you might have to explain to somebody. Say, Jesus Christ died on the cross, and when he died, he shed his blood. His blood, you know, was, was completely out of him when he was, you know, when he died. He basically bled to death. Um, and that, that blood is God's blood, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Okay? So some of the stuff you might need to explain to somebody that's truly wanting to be saved. And some of this stuff, honestly, you'll get saved and you won't really understand some of this. And you'll later on, the Lord's going to show you a lot more. And you're going to go, oh, okay, that makes sense. But when you get to that point of desperation as a, as a sinner and you say, God, please save me. If these elements are there, you're going to get saved. And then things will become clearer as time goes on. But let's continue. Verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. You establish the Ten Commandments, the law there in the Old Testament. You establish it by saying, I understand now through the law that I myself am a sinner and that the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ pays for my sin. You say, well, then you can continue to keep the law to keep yourself safe. No, 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 no. Because my faith in Jesus Christ his righteousness is now imputed to me, and now that thing of having to, to try to work and whatever, it's not there. You know, my salvation was paid for at the cross. You see? It's something else, or it's something that somebody else did for me. 
all my job is in terms of salvation is come to the foot of the cross broken and say, okay, here am I. I'm a sinner. I'm sick. You see? Jesus Christ comes to bring, call the, the, the sinner to repentance. Are you a sinner? Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Yeah. See, you can believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. You say, I believe that. Where faith comes in, faith is, okay, that death that he died on the cross, you believe the written record that God gave us of those events that happened way back in the first century? You believe this book is true? Yes, I do. Okay, now do you have the faith to believe that that sacrifice on the cross can pay for your sins? See? There are a lot of people out there that they believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. They believe that Jesus was a real man and whatever else, but they don't have the faith to follow through with that and say, okay, and that blood that he shed on the cross can pay for my sins. That's the issue here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Anytime that you have somebody that says, I'm going to get in because I'm a good person, I do good things, I do good deeds, sorry, you're not going to get in. Well, okay, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, but now I have to keep the commandments to stay saved. Sorry, nope. You see... Belief comes in saying, I believe Jesus died for my sins. Faith is there to say, and I believe by faith, I can't see it. I can believe this book because I can see it right in front of me. You see? <laughs> but my faith comes in because the events that are here, here and described, I can't see them. I can believe them. But my faith is, is his blood that he shed on the cross, is that enough to pay for my sins? And if you say yes to that, if you say, yes, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, then you understand I'm a sinner. He saved me. There's nothing that I can do to get saved or maintain my salvation or anything else like that. You don't get saved and then say, okay, now we got to go back under the law again. You say, well, then you can just live wickedly. No, you're not going to live wickedly because those wicked things that you did in your past is the reason that you got saved in the first place. You see? You get sick and tired of the old life. You have conviction of sin. You want the changed life. You know? I mean, if somebody comes along and your life is just miserable and you're about ready to blow your brains out and they say, hey, I can help you out. I can tell you how to get out of that life. You know? Really? Well, kind of. I mean, you know, I'm going to have you join this religion thing and pretty much it's not going to change anything in your life. I mean, you're going to pretty much stay the same, but... You know, you know, who's interested? I don't think so. You see? Salvation produces a changed life. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's go to the next one. Here's a good one. You see, Jesus Christ, let me just say this before we get into this, Jesus Christ told his disciples at one point they couldn't cast a devil out of somebody and, and they said, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said, this kind cometh not, but, cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. Prayer. That's the connection that you have to God. There's a lot of people that read this book. That doesn't really connect you to God. Right? You're seeing what God has written but you can have all kinds of thoughts and all kinds of whatever. What connects you to God is when you actually call upon the name of the Lord. Let me show you. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. But what saith it? 
the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. It's the gospel. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I believe what the book says, and I have faith that Jesus died for my sins. And you call out to God and you say, God, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I believe his death on the cross was enough to pay for my sins. You pray to him however you know how. I mean, there's no prescribed, this is what you have to pray to be saved or something. No, you just call upon the name of the Lord. We'll get into that a little bit more here. Verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the devil comes along with his little henchmen and they say, Prayer is a work. Prayer is evil. Prayer is a false gospel. Okay, um, you could get a small child that can just barely read English and read this and see, confess with thy mouth. Uh, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Call upon him. Call upon the name of the Lord and say, is that an action that you do with your mouth? The word is neither even in thy mouth. A small child is going to go, well, of course. So you get home from, from some place and you say, hey, there's been a call for you. you. Say, oh, that means somebody believes. No, it's a call. Something with the mouth. But you see, Satan and his henchmen try to change the plain teachings of Scripture. They come along and they say, yea, hath God said. I know it says call, but it really means believe. There's nothing about prayer in this whole passage. There's not one verse of Scripture that says that you're to pray. Go to hell and burn, you bunch of Satanists. I can read my plain English right there. It's call upon the name of the Lord. And look at, uh, look at verse 11 there. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Believe is inward. You see? But when you call upon the name of the Lord, that's an outward thing. And you start to witness to people about Jesus Christ and you start to talk about your testimony. Why? Because you're not ashamed. You say, oh, that doesn't prove it. That doesn't prove it. Okay. What would be the reverse of this thing? We can see here from these, this passage that man is to call upon the name of the Lord. What's the reverse of that? God hearing. Are there any passages of Scripture where God heard the prayer of a sinner? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I get a little bit ticked off, a little bit arrogant perhaps maybe, but uh, you know, I get a little angry about these people that try to change the plain teachings of the King James Bible. It says, call upon the name of the Lord. All that means believe. Okay, Satan. <laughs> it says call. Call means call. Confess with your mouth. It's all right there in the passage. There's no doubt to anybody that's truly saved or to anybody that has common sense. But just to prove it to you, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Can you receive the grace of God in vain? Can you believe in vain? Yes, you can. Verse 2. For he saith, who? God. He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Hmm. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. How can you get away with this? I mean, how, I mean, how can you get away from the plain English right here to these people out there? There's not one verse that talks about prayer. You better repent before God puts your dirty hide into hell for all of eternity. These people disgust me. Call themselves preachers. Call themselves Christians. And you try to turn people away from praying for salvation. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Something so simple. Something so beautiful. You get somebody that they've gone their own way their whole life. 
and just made a wreck out of their life and they get convicted of their sin and you tell them that Jesus died on the cross for them and they go, oh, do you think he'd save me? Just believe. I, I can't say for sure. You know, I think if you just believe, don't pray because that'll send you to hell. You know, what? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. Verse 2. He saith, God is saying here, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I succured thee. What does succur mean? It means help. They're not saving themselves through good works. They're not saying, I have my belief and therefore I'm saved. They're, God is saying, I'm helping you. Here, he gives you the gift. Is the gift of salvation a help? Is that God securing thee? Yes. And how does it come about? By them calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Anybody, I don't care who they are, anybody that tells you not to pray to be saved is a servant of Satan. Anybody that says it. And I wouldn't watch him for one second. If I was subscribed to somebody like that, I'd say, unsubscribe right away, never watching you again unless you repent of that false teaching. Oh, but he's right in so many other areas. I don't care. If he's changing the, the clear teachings of Scripture that says, call upon the name of the Lord, and right there's a tie-in, if he's doing that, he's a servant of Satan. Mark it down. Acts chapter 10. I'll show you another one. That's not enough. Because I know how these little devil worshipers, they'll go in there and they'll say, well, you see, uh, um, when it says the day of salvation, what it's talking about is the salvation, like um, actually you being saved from temptation here on the earth or something. Yeah. Yep. Continue. Acts chapter 10, verse 30 through 33. Give you another one here. Okay, it says, And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner, by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, all are now therefore are all we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Hmm. So you actually have a lost man praying to God, and God hears him and sends Peter to lead him to Jesus Christ. God's not, it's, you don't have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Uh-huh. Uh, it's right there. Boom, boom, and boom. Oh, well, a uh, uh, call there. This, just is this is all just about belief here, and this is all just... God have mercy on your soul if you're listening to these devils that tell you it's not called upon the name of the Lord, that prayer has no, nothing to do with salvation. God have mercy on you. Because, and I'm saying that because I know how bad God's wrath is. And let me tell you something. If you go through your whole life and you, and you just listen to this false gospel stuff and you say, I just believe and I just, you know, all this other stuff. And we're going to talk about the false gospels here in a little bit. If you do that and you end up in hell for all of eternity... You talk about bad. You knew the gospel and you rejected it. I really don't have sympathy for the teachers of this stuff that tell you not to pray. I have no sympathy for them. Uh, if I found out that they died in a terrible accident and went to hell and burned, I'd just be like, mm, okay, whatever. My sympathy comes for the people that they are deceiving. Okay? So we've gone through the first six steps. Six is the number of men. See? The seventh step is where you become, you receive the inherited nature of Jesus Christ. You're imputed. His righteousness is imputed to you. So now, you change. All of a sudden, the life that you used to live changes. Let me show you the proof from Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I mean, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have cancer, and he says, I can cure you, don't worry about it, and you come out of the operation or whatever else, and you shouldn't go to the doctor, but natural therapy for cancer treatment, but just to prove my analogy, you come out of the treatment and you say, uh, I don't feel any better. Yeah. Did you get rid of the cancer? No. But you're cured. No. You want to come out feeling better. You want your appetite back. You want your strength back. You want your life back. You see? When you get saved, you will be born again. You will have a new life. In Christ Jesus. All those, that old sins and everything else of your past is just wiped away. Now you might have some of the consequences from it. You see? You get yourself in really bad debt and you've been through marriage and divorce and stuff like that and you've been through whatever else. Yeah, you're going to have some of those consequences to live through. But uh, I've seen people have a, their life just totally change. And the horrible wickedness of their sin and things. I mean, I, I've known people that have been cocaine addicts, you know, before salvation, they get saved and it's like their brain should just be fried and they're walking around, they got a clear mind. They're able to preach the gospel. God will, God will do some miraculous things for you when you get saved. You will feel a change. So I haven't felt a change, well, then you're not saved. So that's work salvation. This is works. Backloading works into salvation. Um, no, it's a changed life. God changes your life. Do you understand that? He will show you that path of sanctification. He will start to show you things. I mean, why is God going to show lost people uh, how to clean their lives up? It doesn't make any sense. Clean your whole life up so you can die and go to hell? Of course not. God shows these things to save people. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. For behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. I've gone over these in greater detail in other studies, so I'm not going to go over each point there. But the whole thing is, you're supposed to be approved as a Christian. There's supposed to be works meet for repentance. In other words, things that have, that have changed there in your life, you're going to start to do those good works because God is helping you. You're now His child, His purchased possession. It's a wonderful thing. All of a sudden, you're going to say, you know what, I don't need that alcohol anymore. You know, that cigarette, I don't need that. That pornography I used to look at, it makes me mad now. Those uh, dirty movies, Hollywood movies, I don't even enjoy them anymore. The sound of profanity is just like, ugh, just, ugh, just goes through me. I can't stand it. I used to have a filthy mouth. I can't even get the words out anymore. As soon as I think I'm, I'm, I'm coming under conviction. Yeah. And these people that uh, deny the prayer thing, by the way, I've seen a lot of those people, they're just as wicked and filthy as any other lost person out there. You start looking into their personal life. Something in it. Ephesians. And again, you know, we could be going over so many scriptures here to prove this, that your life changes. I mean, just look at the life of Paul. He's killing Christians. He's a, a Pharisee. He's, he's a highly educated Pharisee, and he's going, actually hunting down Christians. He gets saved, and he goes out, and he's now preaching the gospel, which once he destroyed. Nothing changes, you know, when you get saved. Sure, right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may need, have to give to him that needeth. What a weird contradiction. Here you get some guy who's just stealing. He's a thief. He gets saved. He gets born again. And now he's out. He's got a job. And he's going up to people and saying, hey, let me give you this money. Hey, can I give you some food? Hey, can I give you... Th and they go, weren't you the guy that robbed me a number of years ago? Yeah. Everything's still the same, though. I haven't changed at all. Um, no. Uh, everything changes when you get saved. You will still struggle with sin. I'll tell you that. 
you will learn that. Okay, you will still struggle with sin, but you'll struggle with sin. It won't come easily anymore. And you'll notice another little thing there that happens when you sin as a Christian, you will be chastened of the Lord. So you're not going to be living that kind of life that you used to live. And again, I've done plenty of studies on that. But uh, let's talk about some of the false gospels that are out there. And I'm going to show you how they change the seven steps, the seven parts of salvation. Number one, Lordship salvation. True Lordship salvation. A lot of people try to say that a changed life after salvation. They say, well, that's Lordship salvation. No, it's not. I'm going to show you a good example of Lordship salvation here in just a minute, but let's go over the steps. They would say, number one, you have conviction of sin. All right? You have to have a conviction of sin before you get saved. But then they take number seven and they stick it up here. You have to have a life change. You have to change your life. You have to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And then God grants you repentance. It's Calvinistic. You know, it's God's chosen you and things like this. And, and you don't have no part in your salvation. Be, you know, God forces you through uh, unconditional election. You're just, he forces you to be saved. So he grants you repentance and then grace. His grace comes in and then belief, faith, and prayer. But of course, this has to continue throughout the whole thing. You have to continually have a life change, to change life. The the uh, read something here in just a minute. The, you know the the obedience and things like this. And if you don't, well, then you never really truly were saved. God didn't really truly grant you repentance and things like this. It's not the same thing as a Christian coming to a false convert and saying, "Hey, you know, are you really saved? Make sure that you're saved." See. See, I say to a lot of people, I see false converts all the time, professing Christian false converts, and I say, you know, you're doing this, you're believing that, whatever else. Are you sure that you're saved? Why? Because I want them to be saved. Okay? I want them to come to the point of the seven steps and have that changed life. Right? It isn't about, well, you've got to continue doing certain works to stay saved then. Huh? I'm just talking to people and saying, or make sure that you're not a false convert. Well, brother, I've done this and I've done that. Okay, then you're saved, but you've got to get that thing cleaned up. You know, that's what I teach. But let me show you a good example of a uh, Lordship Salvationist, one of the biggest ones out there right now. Okay, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 says in the King James Bible, that he, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Check this one out. Endures to the end, dot, 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 be saved. The ones who per persevere are the same ones who are saved. Persevere, you get that? Not the ones whose love grows cold. This does not suggest that our perseverance secures our salvation. And it does. Later on, you're going to see, believes that. Scripture everywhere teaches precisely the opposite. God, as part of his saving work, um, secures our perseverance. True believers are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Uh, the guarantee of our perseverance is built into the New Testament, or excuse me, New Covenant promise. God says, I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Jeremiah chapter 32. Wait a second. The New Testament promise, then he quotes from Jeremiah. Or New Covenant promise, then he quotes from Jeremiah. Okay. Non-dispensational wingnut. Those who do fall away from Christ give conclusive proof that they were never truly believers to begin with. Then he quotes 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, talks about the spirit of Antichrist and that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. They were never saved. Okay? They were just false converts. It's not talking about somebody who's saved and messes up in sin. They backslide or something like that. Like, you know, Nutty Boy here is teaching. Um, to say that God secures our perseverance is not to say that we are passive in the process. Uh-oh. However... He keeps us through faith, our faith. Oh boy. Scripture sometimes calls us to hold fast to our faith, Hebrews, quotes Hebrews, or warns us against falling away, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 29, which says if they fall away, it's impossible again to renew them to repentance. See, this is works, is all it is. Um, such admonitions do not negate 
that the many promises the true believers will persevere. Rather, the warnings and pleas are among the means God uses to secure our perseverance in the faith. Notice that the warnings and the promises often appear side by side. For example, when Jude urges believers, keep yourselves in the love of God, he immediately points them to God, who is able to keep you from stumbling. <laughs> yeah. The confused ramblings of a lost man who's tied into all kinds of wicked organizations and things like that. Right? False prophet to the extreme. I had somebody send me that recently. A dear family sent me that, so I might be referring to that thing in the future. But, uh, yeah. You have to show your faith and you have to do certain things. And if you get to a point where you get messed up, then, you know, you'll fall away and you, you won't be able to uh, come back and things like this. And, and he's jumping all over the New Testament to try and prove it. Or excuse me, not the New Testament, but all over the Bible. Let me just show you a verse here quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 um, verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Whereas you, don't, you aren't really thinking about you know, true salvation is what's going on here. Um, verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. In other words, when you get a Christian that is not keeping their sins judged, God will kill them. It says it right there. Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. If it gets really bad as a Christian, God will say, boom, you're dead. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. You can't fall away to the point of losing your salvation. And their little game that these guys play here is they say, well, then you were never truly saved in the first place. Oh, come on, <laughs> please, you know. So it's a system of works. This is a false gospel, Lordship Salvation, because the life changing up here, you have to change your life before you get saved. That's not possible, All right? Your life change comes after you get saved, and then you're still a sinner, but you're going to have the Lord helping you to get away from those sins and fight against sin, Okay? False gospel number two, easy believism. All right? This one removes the first two. You don't have to have conviction of sin, personal conviction of sin. You don't have to have repentance. We'll talk about this. God's grace comes in. Why do you have God's grace? Because we all sin. Okay? We call these the wee wee preachers. Um, we're all sinners. We all need to be saved. We all this. We all wee wee wee. Why? Because they're trying to make the person feel comfortable, you see. They're not trying to say, hey, you're a sinner. I mean, it's fine to say we all sin, all right, as a general truth. That's fine. But when you're witnessing to somebody and you're trying to say, well, we all sin and we all this and we, 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 you know, don't be a wee wee preacher, all right? What we're supposed to do is have that person get under personal conviction. And they say, well, who are you to judge me? I'm saved. You're lost. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you come to God broken as a sinner deserving of hell? Well, how dare you judge me like that? Okay, you're not ready to be saved. You have to be broken before you can be fixed. You understand? But the easy believism heretic comes along and they say, oh no, we all sin. Just, you know, no personal conviction. Just as long as you understand that we're all sinners, then you can get saved. They get rid of conviction of sin, personal conviction of sin. Number four, belief means repenting of unbelief. You go from unbelief to belief. That's repentance. So they'll take conviction of sin, put it down here, and repentance and put it down here, is what they do. I'll tell you why here in just a minute. Then faith comes, they'll preach faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Oftentimes they'll get that the details of faith correct. But then when it comes to prayer, it's a repeated prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you say, preacher, I'd never put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'd like you to bow your head and I'd like you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. And they go through the whole thing. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you know, I accept Jesus into my heart and whatever. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'm going to tell you right now that you're going to go to heaven when you die. Blah, 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 and they do the little thing. They go door to door. They do the same thing. 
Hello, today, I'd like to talk to you today how you can know for sure that you're going to go to heaven. Would you like to know for sure that you could go to heaven? Just give me a few minutes of your time. It'll only take me a little bit. You see, the Bible says, blah, 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 and they go through the little thing. Bow your head, close your eyes. Would you just pray this prayer with me? It's a simple prayer. Let's just pray the prayer. Blah, 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 blah. We all sin, don't we? We all sin, yes. We're all sinners. Yes, you know, see. That's what they do. Prayer is repeated. This is where the sinner's prayer is a bad thing because they just got this little recited prayer and you, as long as you pray the prayer and you believe in your heart and things like this, don't, don't worry about your personal conviction. Don't worry about me judging you and getting you upset. I won't do that. I just want you to, I'd like to invite you to church after you've prayed the prayer. That's why you hear so many of these people, they get saved by some pushy evangelist and then they go to some Babel building someplace and then they're there and they're trying to do the religion thing and then they get totally messed up later on in life and they're going, I once was a Christian, I was a once, you know, whatever, now I'm an atheist. Why? They're a victim of easy believism, that's why. Religion got them. Number seven, the life change is optional. It's so funny to me because easy believism people will call me a lost heretic because I say, you know, I teach the true biblical plan of salvation and yet they'll look at somebody that says, Oh, I went and I did all the steps here. I prayed some prayer. I went to the church and all this other stuff. And they're just wicked and rotten. And they'll say, why? Well, I do think he's saved though. Why? Well, he prayed the prayer and he once believed. He once was a faithful member of First Baptist Church. So I think he's a saved Christian. What about Brian Denling or the teachers that you have to have a changed life? The changed life comes after true salvation. Oh, he's a heretic. He can't be saved. He's a false prophet. Oh. So let me get this straight. I'm supposed to preach salvation without a life change. I've often asked these dumb bunnies, I say, okay, how do I get saved then? Well, I have to go back to this and not have a changed life. I have to repent of my preaching. <laughs> okay. Insanity. And here's one of the newer ones that the devil has concocted. And he's got a bunch of little little children online that are trying to preach this now and trying to come off as uh, saved Bible believers. And they're not. Hyperdispensational wing nuts is what I like to call them. Or satanic heretics, you know, whatever you want to say. They get rid of conviction of sin. Repentance. What they'll do is the hyperdispensationalists will say, well, see, repentance of sin was preached in Acts chapter 2 for Peter. And, and, you know, but the church of the one body that comes in with Paul, he brings in God's grace. So repentance, and see, they aren't saying that Acts is a transition book. You see, they aren't saying that. They're saying that Paul, when the gospel is revealed to Paul, that he goes on his way, he's preaching his gospel to the Gentiles. And Peter and James and John and, you know, they're going over to the Jews and they're preaching the gospel of repentance in Acts 2. Yeah, there are people that believe this. Okay, I have some of the books down here someplace. Um, Cornelius Stam is one of the teachers of this thing. And there's, there's a couple other. These hyper-dispensationalists are idiots. But uh, they'll, they'll come along and they'll say, yes, there was, you know, so you had Paul and Peter on the earth at the same time preaching different gospels, essentially. You know, so that way you can get rid of stuff about repentance. You can just say, well, that... That's the gospel of, you know, to the Jews, you know, but the gospel of the grace of God, that's for Gentiles. That's the, the Paul's crowd there, the church of the one body, you know. <laughs> yeah, idiots is what they are. Belief is your salvation. It's visualized in the mind. Hmm, visualized in the mind. I do remember reading at one point in time uh, a book called uh, The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius de Loyola. Or Ignatius, whatever you want to say. And um, I remember where you go into some of these exercises and you're to get down and you're to imagine and, to, and to envision in your mind Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and envision your sins and everything else. And, and the retreat is not a true retreat unless it's completely silent. In other words, no prayer. You just visualize in your mind how that Christ suffered for my sins and you just envision it, and you go into meditation, and you stay. The supplicant stays on his knees for hours and hours and hours, and he, and he, he understands the pain and everything else. Jesuit. Jesuit. You can watch my study on the uh, satanic self, satanic Ignatian self-righteousness, I think is what it's called. Um, that's what they're teaching. 
Salvation is something that's in your mind. You just simply envision it. You believe it. Faith is faith alone. They'll do this thing, you know. And it's faith alone. It's always been faith alone. It will always be by faith alone. <laughs> All this other stuff. Yeah. Okay. Prayer. See, they do faith alone. And, and see, again, I do believe that salvation is by grace through faith. Because that's what the Bible says. But what these guys do is they'll bring in biblical concepts, biblical types of things, and then they'll, they'll use it as a way to, to bring in their heresy into your life. See? That's what they do. Faith right now is the the thing that you do to be saved. Absolutely. But when they say faith alone, then they're using faith alone to get rid of prayer, to get rid of repentance, to get rid of convic conviction of sin. They use it for all kinds of things. That's the issue. I'm not denying that it's by grace through faith. I'm not denying that. Okay? But these guys will use faith alone as a means of getting in satanic heresy. So get that. Prayer. They say prayer is false works. And they'll take you to Romans chapter 10. And they'll go in there and they'll say, uh, well, Romans chapter 10, it says call, but it means believe. And, and it's confess with your mouth. That doesn't mean that. And all this other stuff. You see? Look it up. You'll see these preachers online. And they'll sound real good in a lot of other areas. They'll be King James only. They'll be dispensational, pre-trib, the whole deal. But they're messed up here. Anybody that's teaching you that prayer doesn't have a part in your salvation is a satanic heretic. All right? They say it's false works. And you say, well, I have a life changed. My life changed after salvation. They'll call that lordship salvation. You know? And I already defined what lordship salvation is. All right? A changed life at salvation does not mean sinless perfection. You're going to sin. But you will feel a change. Things will change. The old hymn, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Yes, you will feel a wonderful change when you truly get saved. So this is one of the more recent ones here. These Satanists come out and they try to come up and change the, the plain teachings of Scripture, change the gospel. And here's what it's really all about. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. The way that you can tell that you are dealing with a false gospel is it will trouble you. They'll take you away from the plain teachings of this King James Bible. They'll tell you that call doesn't really mean call. And if you prayed to be saved, you didn't get saved. All those people in the past that prayed they came forward at a revival meeting or even in the church buildings way back when and stuff like that, and they fell down, they, they called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, they weren't saved. Sorry. Anybody that had a changed life, nope, sorry, they weren't saved. What are they doing? They're troubling you. You see? Why? Because they're perverting the gospel of Christ. You see, perverting means you're changing something from the natural system. You can read this King James Bible and you can see the gospel presented as I have done it here. The first seven parts. Let me go back to that. Okay? You'll see this. This is there. All right? In the King James Bible, you'll see these seven parts of salvation. But these perverts come along and they say, well, actually, prayer's a work. You don't have to have a life change. Repentance simply means turning from unbelief to belief. You don't have to have personal conviction of sin. Just understand that we are all sinners. And that we all deserve God's wrath. And we, 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 we. <laughs> Little piggy went we, 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 we all, all the way home to hell, you know. They'll tell you these things. They pervert the gospel of Christ. Say it one more time. The gospel is, you are a sinner. You have done something wrong that you know if you had to stand before God today, you'd be in big trouble for. Nobody else knows about it. Your mom doesn't know about it. 
dad doesn't know about it, your husband, your wife, your friend, your neighbor, the police, they don't know about it. But God knows about it. Do you feel conviction? Do you have godly sorrow that worketh repentance to salvation? Do you understand that you yourself cannot be saved through your own good works? Law convicts you of sin, but you think that you can somehow work within the system of law to save yourself? It's not going to happen. You need to turn from that way of thinking. Your sins lead you to repentance so that you can say, I can't save myself, but I sure am thankful that God has grace for me. You know what? If you're alive and watching this and you're lost, you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die, you're not saved, you know what you're seeing in your life? You're seeing God's grace. Because those sins, you commit one sin, God is justified in sending you to hell. Well, I'm not that bad. Really? I can tell you right now, you've committed a lot more than one sin. You know you have. God's grace comes in, though. You have to get here first, then understand God's grace. He's let you live in spite of your sins. Do you believe what the Bible says? Do you believe this book? This book tells you how you can know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. You say, well, I can't see it, though. I know that the Bible says it, but I can't see it. Okay, do you have faith? Do you have faith that the blood of Jesus Christ can pay for your sins? Are you willing to humble yourself to the point of calling out to God, praying to God? He'll hear you. He will hear the cries of a broken sinner. You call out to Him and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Whatever your words are, it doesn't matter. I can't, I'm not going to lead you and this has to be the prayer and whatever else. Call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Look up some sinner's prayer or something like that. You can watch our gospel message. I have one in there. And just it's a it's just a basic thing of you know, you can pray that or something a little bit different, but you call out to God. This is what you do. You see? These are the steps that you take. And this is what God will do for you. Number seven. You see, the Bible has a system of numbers. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of completion. The number of God. Tied to God and His system. This is what you do up here. This is what God does to you. I didn't say this is what you do to maintain salvation. As long as you're doing this, then you'll stay saved. I didn't say that. People lie about me. They say that that's what I teach. I don't teach that, never have, never will. This is what God does in your life. He'll change your life. He heals you. You come to the Savior saying, I'm sick. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I'm not to come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's simple. But people are coming along and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Don't fall for them. 